thunder, lightning, and more than enough political infighting. Join me as I talk about Numa Pompilius, the king who cleaned up Rome. What have the Romans ever done for us? Hi, and thanks for listening. This is the Ancient History Hound podcast. My name is Neil, and you can find me on Twitter, where I am, at Ancient Blogger, and loads of ancient history content on my website, ancientblogger.com, so feel free to pop by and have a look or just say hello. In this podcast, I'm going to talk about Numa Pompilius, the king who came after Romulus, and is commonly known as Rome's second king, in the period where Rome had a monarchy. He was said to have ruled from 716 BCE to 673 BCE, or thereabouts, and has been viewed as the king who made Rome religious. As such, he's viewed as a pious pioneer, but don't let that fool you. There's plenty to talk about, which includes some very odd goings on indeed. And I think it's only prudent of me to flag my last episode, which I recorded, as it links in with some of what I'll be talking about today. The episode was Rome's Foundation Myth, and in it I discussed how Rome's foundation myths were handled, and I finished up with the demise of Romulus. This is a standalone episode, so you don't need to have listened to it, but I'm going to be biased and advise that if you haven't listened to it, you give it a go. Before I start, I want to explain what you can expect. The term I've heard used is setting the table, and with one tale involving Numa, that's very apt. I'm going to start by looking at Rome prior to Numa's arrival and how he got to be king, and then going to focus on some of the religious institutions he founded, which involve magic charms, burying people alive and lots of dancing, so standard Roman stuff. I'll also try and understand what the side effects of these were socially, plus there'll be the odd tangent, which I imagine you'll probably be expecting if you've listened to any of my other episodes. Finally, I'll be considering how Rome in the 1st century BCE utilised his image and indulged in some speculation as to how the sources facilitated this. The sources I'll be using, by the way, for much of this are Livy, Dionysus of Halicarnassus and Plutarch. As a caveat to them, I'm going to suspend my disbelief and work as much as I can with the accounts they've given, though there are of course points where even they don't quite believe what's going on. In any case, let's start, and in order to do so, we need to travel way back to the early times of Rome. To help understand Numa and his reign, we need to turn the water clock back to the end of the 8th century BCE and to a newly founded city called Rome. Forget about the Rome you're currently thinking of. This wasn't a thriving place with stunning architecture and lots of tourists. It was a small settlement with a number of very big problems. The biggest of these, and one which we'll start with, was a lack of leadership. Romulus was, well, he wasn't around anymore. And the reason for this was either that he disappeared in a storm and was taken to heaven, or a group of senators had killed him and cut him into pieces so his body couldn't be discovered. In fact, the taken-to-heaven option was pushed further when a senator was visited by Romulus who assured him that he had ascended to the heavens, and the senator then recounted the story to the masses who didn't quite buy it completely. Rome was therefore a touch paper waiting to be lit, and what made it worse was there didn't seem to be a plan in place to fill that power vacuum that had been created. What resulted was a system called an interregnum which aimed to last for a year, Both Dionysus and Livy describe a somewhat complex arrangement whereby senators effectively played king for a day or king for five days before passing it to another senator. This outcome was and is easy to criticise. It feels naive and ill thought out. Yet in fairness, the interregnum was a response to a set of internal dynamics which can largely be boiled down to the old versus the new. As Rome had grown, it had accrued new people within its borders and sphere of influence, and one such tribe were the the Sabines, which I mentioned again in my podcast on the foundation myth of Rome. They hailed from the northeast of Rome and were absorbed into it following the infamous incident where the Romans kidnapped and married their women. The resulting war between Rome and the Sabines ended with a truce, and the Sabine king, who's got a fantastic name, Titus Tatius, joined Romulus as a sort of co-ruler, though it's not exactly clear how he functioned. The important thing to note was that some Sabines moved to Rome as part of it, and a number even joined Rome's Senate. Sabines had that quality about them that the Romans found retrospectively charming. And by that, I mean many centuries later, when it was far safer to do so, 
In later coinage, which I'll be coming to much later on, Numa was depicted as hairy with an obligingly liberal beard. Set against this were the Romans, but these weren't the snobby elite patricians of later centuries. Let's not forget that they weren't exactly old stock themselves, most of them having moved from Alba. And perhaps that is what made it worse. The Roman senators of the time might have been a mix of nobles from Alba and the wannabes to whom the newly joined Sabines provided them with social points of plenty to score off. And the engine behind all of this was that both sides wanted the next ruler from their faction or tribe. Neither side would budge. And from this, the only solution was to have the Senate divided up with the groups who could only rule for a short time, thus ensuring no power grabs. Livy, Plutarch and Dionysus all viewed the political landscape slightly differently. They referred to the strife between the Sabines and the Romans in the Senate, and also outside of it within the scope of the entire population. For example, Livy wrote that the interregnum wasn't at all popular with the masses, who, to be fair, had seen Romulus, who they adored, most likely killed by the same political body, which was now sitting around not really doing much. In response to this, a solution was proposed, albeit one which is framed differently by Livy and Dionysus and Plutarch. Livy's version was that the masses, and by this I mean the non-senators, suggested a name of a person, and if the Senate accepted it, they'd ratify and make that person a king. Seems quite simple. In both Plutarch and Dionysus, it's a bit more complex. The Sabine faction in the Senate were going to suggest a name and had the Roman senators ratify their decision. The difference pivots over who is seen as the disenfranchised group. For Livy, it's the masses as a whole, and for Dionysus and Plutarch, it's the Sabines or newer senators within the Senate. I think the difference is an important one. I see Livy's account as placing the tension between the people and the Senate over the new arrangement, and by doing so, it avoids detailing the tensions within the Senate. It's depicted as a unified body. For Plutarch and Dionysus, the Senate was a broken and ill-functioning government. However, all three historians agree on whose name was given. This was Numa Pompilius. You might wonder what qualified Numa for the role. Well, if I told you he was an established senator in Rome who, though Sabine understood the political and social culture, you might think that was a great choice. And in truth it would be, except that wasn't Numa. Numa lived in Cures, C-U-R-E-S, which is identified as modern-day Farah Sabina. This is around 50 kilometres or 30 miles northeast of Rome. He'd likely never visited Rome, and as we'll see, wasn't really looking for the role. The historians all mention how he had a great reputation, but, but I'm unsure how the masses, if you follow Livy's line, all decided on him alone, or even knew who he was. As for the other option, whereby the Sabine or newer senators nominated him, this also raises an eyebrow. How come they didn't suggest a Sabine senator from their own ranks? Is it possible that Numa was simply the first one that both the older Romans and the newer Sabine senators could agree on, and if so, how far down the list was he? I think there's some political gamesmanship at play, which really isn't a surprise. The Sabines in the Senate wanted someone possibly from their ranks, but the older Roman faction didn't fancy this much. Why would you want someone in power who you'd been facing off against and most likely had grievances to settle? Better someone who had no political baggage but gave the Sabines a cheap thrill as he was one of theirs. Picture the scene. One day you hear a knock at the door and it's a delegation from a city claiming that you are the new ruler or at least you've been offered the role. It feels more akin to a Monty Python sketch than anything but this is how... The account of Numa's accession is told by Plutarch, who wrote that Numa was far from interested and turned the role down. And place yourself in issues, why wouldn't you? You're being offered by a job by the same people who probably killed their last employer. Not only that, you're 40, so you're looking forward to just getting your feet up. Dionysus gives a slightly shortened version of this, which follows the same narrative of Numa being offered the role and then refusing it. This refusal only served to mark him in greater esteem, as the Romans thought he was even more upstanding. Let's face it, this is a trope used in the modern era, wherein the hero is a reluctant one, who doesn't want the power and the glory of their destiny, and this irony is defined as a reason why they are perfect to be the hero. Livy's version doesn't mention this at all. The Roman embassy turns up, and Uma agreed, albeit with a caveat that he'd only agree if the gods permitted it through a specific ritual. I suppose it's a slight pushback on behalf of Numa, but in any case, Numa eventually took the offer and arrived in Rome. 
Numa's arrival in Rome was met with a lot of praise from all quarters. People flocked to meet him on the way and cheered him into the city. Yet there were still formalities to be undertaken. Dionysus and Plutarch both wrote that Numa was initially accepted through a vote by the populace before going through to the next stage of confirmation. Livy didn't mention this vote, which is a tad surprising, simply because his presentation of the solution earlier on was framed as a discussion between the people and the Senate. But in any case, the religious confirmation of Numa was hugely important. It begins the theme of Numa being this religious heavyweight and links back to Romulus as he was confirmed as founder of the city by a divine sign. In that instance, it had been bird spotting. Remus had seen six vultures from the Aventine and Romulus twelve from the Palatine. Numa ascended to the citadel, which was itself was on the Capitoline, and set in a chair facing south. An augur then prayed and looked into the sky for the correct omens. Exactly what these were isn't clear, but surprise, surprise, they were soon spotted and Numa was confirmed king. Up until this point, I've followed the narrative of Numa quite closely because it made the most sense, particularly in how he got to be king. But now I can leave Numa duly ensconced in Rome and pick out some of what he did and the stories attached to him. I'll start with what he became renowned for, his religious reforms and initiatives. In the works of Livy, Dionysus and Plutarch, Numa is credited with a suite of religious initiatives and developments. As Livy comments, the Romans at this point were an unruly mob who had little appreciation of religious observance and piety, which was, funny enough, to become a defining trait of the idealised Roman in later times. In short then, Numa got very busy very quickly, and I'll start with the priesthood he established in Rome, which I reckon you've probably heard of. They were the Vestal Virgins. It's worth pointing out that the Vestals weren't invented by Numa. The mother of Romulus and Remus had been made a Vestal in order to prevent her having any children. And all this had happened in Alba Longa, long before Rome's foundation. It continues upon a theme I picked off in the previous podcast that I did, that Rome was happy to import religious practices and give them that unique Roman twist. Though as with much of Rome's history, the accounts of the Vestals and what they did is written from a later perspective, so allow me to give an overview of what the Vestals were and what they became in Rome. The process to become a Vestal started very young. Candidates weren't adults or even what we'd see as teenagers. Instead, girls of 6 to 10 years of age were chosen by lot, as long as they had no physical impairments and that their parents were both alive and married. Given that Augustus opened the lottery to daughters of freeborn citizens, the chances are that this was initially reserved for the more elite classes and families in Rome. Once signed up, the Vesta was taken from her family and existed in a quite unique liminal space. And by this, I mean that she was no longer under the power or protection of her father, or even a male guardian. She was paid and allowed to write her own will. Vestals had a range of opportunities open to them, which a normal Roman woman wouldn't even dream of. For example, they could be carried on a litter and have a lictor walk in front of them and even ride in a two-wheeled wagon. The best seats at the amphitheatre and theatre were reserved for them. They also attended the odd banquet or two. Vestals were held in high regard. If a criminal met one as he was transported through the city, that criminal could be pardoned as long as the Vestal confirmed their meeting was an accident. And I suppose this makes sense, as otherwise you can imagine a Vestal being flash mobbed. In the first century CE, they were even reckoned to have a superhuman, or a be it, niche superhuman ability. Pliny the Elder commented in a letter that Vestals could fix a runaway slave to the spot by use of a special prayer. It's not entirely Professor X, but it must have been very useful given the number of slaves in Rome at that time. And a picture, therefore, emerges of the Vestal not being a woman moved to a life of piety which required isolation. They were active, and this even extended to the sphere of law. Vestals could give testimony in court. Cicero's account of M. Fonteo's trial in 70 BCE included his sister, a Vestal, making an emotive plea. Cicero noted that her heightened emotional state was because the Vestal had no husband or family of her own, as you'd expect. And from that, we might consider that the Vestals, though legally separate and distinct from their family, weren't distant from it. And we see this later. In the imperial period, Vestals often appear on the horizon, often making direct appeals to an emperor. 
Aunia Torquata managed to persuade Tiberius, which was quite something in itself, to change the destination of her brother's exile to the much nicer Delos. Vibidia was less successful when trying to stop her father getting expelled from the Senate. But we shouldn't focus too much on the success rate. What's important is that they had this access and could do so. If you're a Vestal, you'd live in a sort of temple complex, and the temple itself can be partially seen today in the Forum, but it's not the original. In fact, it's not entirely known when the original temple was built, though estimates give the 6th century BCE as the likely time that it was built, and it's Numa who apparently built this, which is obviously why including this here. Its main function was to house the sacred flame, which in many ways symbolised Rome itself. This was lit in March each year, and done so using mirrors, the thinking was that the light came directly from the sun and therefore was of the highest purity. If the flame went out, it was considered the gravest of errors and this could result in immediate punishment for the Vestal who was responsible. As we'll see, this wasn't the worst thing which could happen to you if you were a Vestal. Aside from tending the fire, Vestals were involved in festivals throughout the year. In May they threw straw figures into the Tiber. In April, ashes were scattered to purify the people, and these had been stored in their warehouse called the Penis, and was opened for offerings at the Vestalia in June of each year. A theme you might be getting is that Vestals captured the essence of Rome, they were bound to it, and this sort of responsibility came at a price. The crux of a Vestal's commitment to her role was her chastity. If a Vestal was considered to have broken her vow, she would be charged with the crime of incestum, and if she was found guilty, a terrible fate would befall her. I'll leave Plutarch to describe it. And I quote, She is buried alive near the Colleen Gate. A small chamber is brought underground with steps leading down. In this, a small couch is placed with coverings, a lit lamp and some provisions such as food and water. The culprit is placed on a litter which is covered and fastened down. All the people act in silence. When the litter reaches its destination, they unfasten the cords and the chief priest utters a prayer before leading her down by the steps. After she has gone down, the steps are taken up, and earth is thrown down to cover the entrance, hiding it away. This seems as bizarre a manner of execution as it was horrible, yet it offers further common insight into how the Vestals were perceived. To start with, the process of entombing someone alive avoids killing them directly, and therefore it didn't afford what was known as pollution or blood pollution, particularly associated with killing a priestess who, though she had done something wrong, might still have some repercussions. And in part, I suppose that makes some sort of sense, but why burying underground? It's plausible that this removed the act from the visual perspective, a sort of out of sight, out of mind. But consider how the Vestal was unique, and the word I used a bit earlier was liminal. This is defined as relating to a transition or occupying a position across a boundary or state. Liminal is certainly a word we can use with the Vestals because they operate in a really quite ambiguous state much of the time. For example, a Vestal was a woman, but she wasn't expected to fulfil the normal duties of one, that is to say, being a wife and a mother. Much of what they did and the benefits they enjoyed nourish this sense of liminality and ambiguity. Killing them by not directly killing them and placing them in a space between the dead and the living was simply a continuation of this theme of liminality. And by the way, there was also the excuse the Romans had that if uh, Vesta was truly innocent, the goddess Vesta would come and rescue her. The reason a Vestal came to be charged is sometimes mentioned in our sources. Oppia was convicted in 483 BCE, and Livy wrote that this was due to bad portents being reported at Rome. In a slightly different way, Postumia was put on trial in 420 BCE, but found innocent. And the rationale for her conviction, or her being brought to trial, was that she wore pretty clothes and possessed a sharp wit. Minucia was charged for similar reasons, but sadly found guilty in 337 BCE, as was Sextilia in 273 BCE. It's possible to conclude from these instances that incestum was the charge, but it might be fuelled by other motives, perhaps political jealousy or even the concept of the scapegoat, which I'll come to in a bit. The Vestal was almost a living embodiment of Rome's spiritual moral worth, so if 
portents and bad omens were seen, then the logic could be that the gods were angry and therefore it was because the Vestals had misbehaved or even required punishment. And a really good example of this was around 216 BCE, where Rome experienced a spectacular defeat to Hannibal at Cannae. Not surprisingly, bad portents had been seen and two Vestals were killed. One committed suicide before anything happened and the other was entombed. Things were so bad following the defeat, the Romans took a pair of Greeks and a pair of Gauls and buried them alive as well. Going back to the point I made about scapegoating, there is a line of thought that the Vestals acted in this way. They were scapegoats in waiting and could be sacrificed to appease the gods when conditions were bad. Obviously this is a separate topic and formed part of a wider debate, but it's worth noting that Incestum was a charge and the Vestal in question would stand trial. It wasn't there for an immediate outcome and I suppose that moves slightly against the idea of them being a sacrifice. That immediacy is lost if you've got to then go to court. By the way, I've realised I've not mentioned what happens to the person, to the, to the man in all of this. And if the man was caught, who was involved with the Vestal, he'd be beaten to death in the forum. The person in charge of the Vestals was the Pontifex Maximus. And it was he, as well as other pontifices, who carried out the trials of incestum. In the imperial period, the Pontifex Maximus was often the emperor as well. But prior to this, there is a split from the Vestal being politically accountable to, say, the Senate. Of course, this is only technically so. I can imagine the Pontifex being leaned upon to act, but at least in theory, the accountability of Vestal was within the scope of the religious infrastructure which Numa had implemented. This is another way in which they had that liminal aspect. They weren't accountable in the same way that normal Romans were. Given the involvement of the Pontifex Maximus and the Vestals, it's little surprise that the Pont Pontifex and the Pontifesses were linked inherently to Numa, who is said to have established them. Livy wrote the first Pontifex, which was presumably the Pontifex Maximus once the others turned up, was called Numa Marcius. And the Pontifexes can be thought of as the religious bureaucracy of Rome. Plutarch listed the responsibilities of the Pontifex Maximus and the Pontifexes, I hate saying that word by the way, I do apologise, as interpreting divine will, being in charge of public sacrifices, ensuring established customs were followed, teaching the correct propitiation for the gods, and ensuring correct burial rites, which is a real wide range of duties and responsibilities. And from this I get the sense of them being really active in the population of Rome at the time. And given that Livy gave that curt remark earlier about the religious knowledge of your average Roman back then, it seems inherently logical to have a priesthood which had to engage with your average layman or lay Roman. Next up, I've got two more priesthoods with which Numa was said to have established in Rome, and both were very different in their nature. But before I get to that, I want to quickly discuss t-shirts. If you follow my Instagram, website, and Twitter, you'll have noticed I enjoy spending money I don't have on ancient history-themed t-shirts. I am that person in the office. I've managed to find some really good ones, and recently I stumbled across HistorySwagger.com. It's a store envy website, which I didn't really know much about, and it's got some excellent designs on it. I picked up two t-shirts, the Punic Wars one and the Livy one. I then contacted the owner and designer on Twitter. He's got the handle at Swagger History. I said how good the designs were, and he gave me a discount code for anyone visiting his website. To get 10% off, which is literally decimating the cost of your purchase, just enter Ancient History Hound at the checkout in the discount field. Just to recap then, go to historyswagger.com and if you like anything and want to buy something, use Ancient History Hound as one word in the checkout to get 10% off. Back now to the priesthoods. The two additional ones I'm going to discuss are the Fetiales and the Sally. Plutarch summed the Fetiales up quite nicely when he wrote that they went to those who did wrong and appealed for fair treatment. As such, they seem to have helped with social cohesion, perhaps functioning as mediators in disputes within the population, and given what we know about Rome at this time, they had their work cut out. Dionysus gave us two additional details. Firstly, they were drawn from the best families, and secondly, they could veto military action. The latter feels like quite a bold step, Rome, up until this point, was belligerent to say the least, so having a separate body able to veto possible war seems quite unexpected. Perhaps so, but Rome must have been low on available men by that point, 
Warfare had two logistical problems for any city-state. It lowered the number of available citizen males and also took them away from the duties they might be performing back home. For example, as smiths or farmers. Numa was a peacemaker. For him, it might have made sense to have a religious body which could keep Rome on a leash, whilst he was able to focus on the important social issues it was exposed to. But Numa didn't completely pacify Rome's intentions. Instead, they were bound in correct religious process. For example, how do you think Rome declared war after Numa? What do you think he brought in to make sure that Rome was declaring war correctly? Well, as you might have guessed, it came through a specific ritual, but perhaps not one you might know. It involved Efetiales going to the city of the tribe in question. When he arrived at the border, he called upon Jupiter and the rest of the gods to witness that he was there to demand justice. He then took an oath that he was going to a city which had done an injury to Rome. He called as a witness the first person he met and repeating the same oath he went to the forum of the city and explained to the magistrates the reasons for him coming whilst repeating his oath. If the city wanted time, he could give 10 days before coming back, and this had a maximum use of three turns. So if after 30 days or before it, justice wasn't forthcoming, he called the gods to witness and then returned to Rome where he explained the outcome to the senate. If this wasn't followed, the Senate could not vote for war. I find two aspects of this fascinating. The first is that this was a body which took power from the king, or at least seemed to check and balance it. The Fetiales could in theory revoke a king's idea to go to war. Perhaps they could claim the portents were wrong or something similar. But they could also have the opposite effect. If a king wanted to go to war, they could stick a nice bow atop it, as it were. Done this way, war could be sold to the populace as one ordained and permitted by the gods. This sort of divine sanction for warfare isn't uncommon in antiquity. Even the Spartans, not exactly shy of a fight, would only commit to a battle once the portents were favourable. The second theme is the creation of a series of religious appointments or offices to keep the mobiles happy. And if you have a single point of power, it's very easy for the elite families to feel disenfranchised, and as Roman Romulus might tell you, when the elite families get disenfranchised, they can also get a bit stabby. What better way then to offer them roles with some power to keep them relatively busy and happy? And the final set of priests I want to talk about were both associated with war and seem at the very least very happy about it. According to Plutarch, in the eighth year of Numa's reign, a pestilence hit Rome, which is not unusual. What was unusual, if not downright odd, was a shield which fell from the sky. The shield was taken to Numa, who said it must have been sent from the gods, obviously. Appreciating that such an item might be stolen, he ordered copies to be made, and then 11 priests were selected and those copies given to them as well as the original. They were called the Sally, often known as the Leaping Priests. The leaping in this context related to the style of dancing the priests adopted whilst holding the shields and hitting them with daggers. The priests wore cone caps and embroidered tunics, which made them quite a sight and sound, if you can imagine the noise generated from a shield being hit that way. I think of them as a sort of weaponised glee club. Each march, they would dance through the city, though it's possible they may have been active more often, given that their association with was Mars. Perhaps they featured at festivals or more opportune times. This was a type of religious outreach to engage the ears and the eyes of the Romans. It must have been quite something to watch and hear. And in many ways, it aligns with what we were talking about earlier, when the pontifices were going out and speaking to the lay Roman. But Numa didn't just reach out using people, he also built structures. One I've mentioned, the Temple of Vesta, but he also built temples to Faith and Terminus. The latter concerned boundaries. Perhaps most famous was his Temple of Janus, which served as a visible sign of whether Rome was at war or at peace. If the doors of the temple were open, Rome was at war. If closed, then at peace. Just in case you're wondering, Livy wrote that since Numa's reign, the doors were only closed twice. Once after the First Punic War, and secondly, after Actium. The Temple of Terminus focused more on boundaries, as I've mentioned, and with boundary stones dedicated to Jupiter Terminalis. If you tried to move or demolish them, you could face execution. Doubtless this helped Numa's division of the city into districts, each with its own supervisor. These could be farmed, and so by using religion, Numa had effectively directed the populace into developing an agricultural base, which was certainly needed. The boundary stones therefore fixed people's lands and the places they owned, and stopped people falling out and squabbling. 
Religion could therefore have secondary effects which might have been the real motivation. After all, Numa had to stabilise what was quite a ferocious and agitated populace. Rather than turn their eyes outwards, Numa's reforms looked to introduce a sort of introspective concepts which would help soften the Roman mob. The elite families were bought off with the prospects of religious office as a sort of social indicator. Dionysus added an interesting detail when he mentioned further political tensions between the older noble families and the newer ones as occurring after Numa had arrived. So the idea that you could capture these rivalries in the competition for religious office makes perfect sense. But these religious offices weren't simply token. They had a semblance of power. Take the Fetiales, who could check and balance any pro-war party in the Senate, or a particularly angry king. Or the pontifices, who directed the people, regardless of social class, on religious matters. Numa moved the king away from being the sole arbiter of everything. Now the gods could direct the people through signs and portents, which were understood and made apparent through the priestly offices. I think of this as a necessary buy-off. One person with sole power in every regard came with too much of a target on his back. Better that the people, which included the lower classes, had some say or at least felt that the political decisions were informed by the gods. And these political decisions couldn't just be made on any old day. Numa rearranged the calendar, marking certain days as unlawful, and thus meaning that public business couldn't be conducted then. And this meant no Senate. I think a possible reason for this was to slow down how reactive the Senate could be. After all, it had the tendency to overheat somewhat, and reducing the number of instances it could sit might prevent knee-jerk reactions or a sudden cry to the benches. It wasn't just the elite classes who had to be satiated. Plutarch described how Numa created groups according to their trade, for example, musicians, smiths and carpenters. The intention was to break down the existing barriers, whereby people might identify themselves as a Sabine or a Roman. And the question you might be thinking is, OK, that's nice, but how did Numa do this exactly? How did he take a rough lot and turn them into all God-fearing folk? Well, sit down and pretend to be shocked. He told some whopping lies. The intention behind them seems to have been to get the people on the side and believe that he had some divine connection. This was done through his alleged dalliance with Egeria, a nymph who visited him guiding him in the skills of reigning. But the Romans weren't just about to believe that without some sort of proof. According to Plutarch, he invited some nobles to his apartments for a meal. They found austere and simple dwellings, with what could be described as a very basic spread. Suddenly he announced that the goddess enjoined him an abracadabra. The room was furnished with luxurious couches and the roof of the food was a fabulous and sumptuous banquet. The account which Dionysus provided was similar except for one slight difference. The nobles were dismissed and asked to come back later and when they did, voila, a top-notch dining experience. This version feels a bit less miraculous. He didn't have the favours of a goddess, just the number of a great caterer, but hey, it worked. Numa's divine interactions didn't stop at Egeria. According to Plutarch, there were two mischievous demigods called Picus and Faunus who lived around the Aventine. They were pranksters and behaved much like satyrs and dactyls. Numa wanted to capture them and did so using wine and honey mixed into a spring which they drank at. As he seized them, they changed into various forms. However, Numa held on and they taught Numa things which were to come. This tale feels a bit like a composite of other myths where something unusual, perhaps a creature or a god, is captured and forced to give up something. You might remember Proteus being caught by Menelaus and Thetis being caught by Peleus, who was Achilles' dad. Both Proteus and Thetis shifted their forms and appearance, seemingly as a test to their captor who had to hold on. Peleus' reward for keeping hold of Thetis as she changed was he got to marry her. Menelaus got something quite different. He was given answers to questions he needed. Picus and Faunus' gift to Numa was as much arts or crafts as anything else. They taught him a charm made of sprats, onions and hair. Now what might this charm be used for? Now, you're never going to guess, so I'll put you out of misery. It was against lightning, and more specifically, being struck by it. And the importance of such a charm is something I'll deal with later, so make a mental note of it now. We can accept by now that Rome was happy to import religious practices, and the Etruscans were always an influential neighbour. For them, lightning was especially important to understand the will of the gods. Nine Etruscan divinities could throw it, 
and they map the sky into 16 sections, the outcome of which is a mind-bending number of potential reads, which a lightning bolt might give you. In the later Roman Republic, a thunderstorm with lightning might dissolve an assembly of the people, and if a magistrate saw a flash of lightning, they could suspend all political business for the day. Needless to say, this was abused. You might have heard of how Bibulus attempted to prevent Julius Caesar, his fellow consul, from enacting laws and business by seeing lightning quite frequently. For obvious reasons, thunder was also associated with lightning, and the Etruscans had a brontoscopic calendar, which allowed a peal of thunder on a specific day to be read and interpreted as an omen. For example, if you heard thunder on June the 2nd, it was a good sign, as long as you were giving birth. Numa's association to all of this wasn't born on the back of a fancy story and a wider religious practice. Direct evidence and a link can be found with an altar he had dedicated to Jupiter Elysius on the Aventine. According to Varro, a 1st century BC scholar and writer, the word Elysius comes from the verb Elysiere, to lure forth. This is backed up by Livy, Pliny and even the poet Ovid in describing the altar to Jupiter Elysius as being a place where rites were conducted to bring forth lightning. The question as to why you might want to undertake such a dangerous activity is hopefully now a bit clearer. From the lightning, Numa possibly with other priests could interpret divine will. The somewhat bizarre charm now seems to make a bit more sense. The obvious danger would be to perform the rites incorrectly or find that Jupiter wasn't in a good mood. I'm not going to give any spoilers for future episodes, but one Roman king was to find this out at his own expense. Unsurprisingly, the dangerous capabilities of lightning were well known. After all, they were Zeus's chief weapon, and Pliny wrote that an entire city called Volsilium had been consumed by lightning. More specifically, however, were the accounts of lightning and the Alban kings. Alba Longa had been the city which, in a way, preceded Rome. It was there that Romulus and Remus set from when they decided to found the new city. Dionysus and Livy both gave lists of the kings of Alba which spanned the period between Aeneas and Romulus and Remus. It's one of the awkward parts of the foundation myth as you have lots of initial action and then the sources have to cover the few hundred years between Aeneas and the twins being born. This takes the form of a near Tolkien someone son of someone format but it's not without interest. One king, called Romulus Silvus, is notable by the fact that he was killed by lightning. Livy doesn't say much else, which is frustration, but very typically Livy. He had a habit of mentioning quite fascinating and weird events, and then passing by. More curious than Romulus Silvus was an Alban king called Aloysius, and I'll read Dionysus' account of him. To quote, He was a tyrannical creature and odious to the gods. He reigned nineteen years. Contentious of the divine powers, he had contrived imitations of lightning and sounds resembling thunderclaps, with which he proposed to terrify people as if he were a god. But rain and lightning descended upon his house and the lake beside, which it stood rose to an unusual height, so that he was overwhelmed and destroyed with his own household. I appreciate this is a near unanswerable question, but given what we know about Jupiter Elysius and the Etruscan tradition of protoscopy, was Romulus Silvus killed during a ritual? And I'm not saying he drew down lightning, but perhaps he performed a rite deliberately during a thunderstorm. Likewise, did Elosius try and fool the people into thinking he had the ability to read thunder and lightning? Was it possible that he built something which gave nicely prompted flashes of light and crashing sounds? To give a more modern version of this, think of those fake seances where lights dim and knocking sounds all created to fool the people there. In this sort of situation, a charm to protect against lightning during a ritual was possibly a good idea, even if it smelt a bit weird. It allowed Numa to safely conduct the rites without being a conductor in the other sense. How he gained the charm simply allowed for yet another fabulous tale, not that Plutarch believed a word of it. This tale of Numa's lightning charm is a good example of how stories about Numa could contain a simple truth and accompanied with an elaborate tale spun to accentuate his religious and fantastical credentials. When I came across the altar of Jupiter Elysius, I thought of it as an amusing, albeit inconsequential, tidbit. But the more I read into it and around it, the more I realise that in many ways it symbolised Numa and how the accounts of him are built. Let me explain. Firstly, it centres on a religious ritual, which seems to be part of a wider practice that predated Rome. Secondly, as a fantastic tale, 
These two elements are neatly woven around each other, making it hard to work out if there was a genuine truth behind it. Not the ability to call down lightning. I mean, Numa is having established a cult in Rome with an altar which looked to read omens and portents through lightning. And overarching all of this was the function of it all. Having such a feature binds the populace into the acceptance of divine will as a way of dictating current political actions or policy. Have the crops failed? Or has there been a disease? Well, rather than allow this to ferment into strife amongst the people, let's use lightning to elaborate on what we have done wrong and how we can remedy it. In such a way, the altar to Jupiter Elysius is host to a number of key themes I've talked about, particularly in the context of looking behind the immediate purpose of a right priesthood or activity, and considering how they drove a change in public life. The religious offices that Numa brought in meant something tangible. OK, you might have to dance around a bit, but you could also be responsible for administering sacrifices, ensuring standardised religious behaviour, and even affect what we would now call foreign policy. In short, they were worth bothering about, and for a society which dripped with competition for social prestige, this was catnip. The fierce political rivalries which had preceded Numa's arrival, and occurred shortly after it, could be captured and moved into a competition for religious office, which was a far safer way of handling that particular dynamic. Then there were the less obvious and more subtle effects. Take the respect for boundaries, which may have been a source of possible discontent. In the modern day, an overhanging tree and a neighbour's fence are common tropes and cause feuds which escalate into mild lunacy. But make those boundaries owned by the gods, and suddenly those potential flare-ups are more difficult to be had. On the subject of boundaries, the people were given the defined portions of land, where the inherent competitive drive might ensure a benefit in the agricultural context, which Rome, as I said, certainly needed. Even here, Numa had supervisory offices for citizens, which must have satisfied the odd ego and possibly helped develop new friendships. It can be argued that Rome was given a new sense of identity through these changes. Numa's reforms ensured there was a new boss in town, called religion, and it didn't care a jot whether you identified as Sabine or Roman, just as long as you adopted a pious reverence and made sure that you acted in accordance with it. The idea of one single king was replaced with someone still easily identified as one, but the points of power could sit outside and alongside him. Viewed in this way, I think of Numa as a very suave political operator. According to the sources, Numa reigned for 42 years after coming to Rome and died peacefully. The latter point is almost an indicator of success in its own right. Rulers in Rome, be they king or emperor or dictator, weren't often taken away by old age or in peace. Climbing the political ladder to the top was dangerous in Rome, and that danger didn't stop when you stopped climbing. Numa was said to have died around 673 BCE, and though he certainly laid the platform for Rome to grow and develop as a society, it was still a newborn city-state, taking its first breaths. It wasn't even 100 years old. Even if we take the more considered line through the source accounts, discard some of the more fanciful events, he was vital in ensuring Rome was given a chance in the territory full of rivals. This does lead me to wonder and speculate whether Newman needed to exist, and to what extent his account was retrospectively furnished with the trappings that we see elsewhere when a city-state has a character who arrives from outside and sets the agenda. Think of Solon at Athens, or Lycurgus at Sparta. Was this something folded into the Numa myth? To hopefully shine some light on this, I'm going to leave Numa of the past and look at Numa of the current, albeit current to when the three sources I've been citing were active. And it's here that I talk more about this idea of retrospectively building the account of Numa, as well as some other aspects of it. Livy and Dionysus were both active towards the end of the 1st century BCE. And if you didn't know, this was a period of intense political upheaval in Rome. That said, you could probably make that claim in most points of Rome's history. Rome moved from a republic through a series of wars into its first emperor. Plutarch was active later, towards the end of the 1st century CE, and from the safer shores of Greece. Of course, this meant their histories and accounts related to events some 700 or so years earlier. It's akin to me writing a history about Robert the Bruce. That said, it's likely they used earlier historians as reference material, but even then, the proverbial library section marked Roman history wasn't well stocked. Fabius Pictor is commonly referred to as the first Roman historian, and he dated to around the late 3rd century BCE. That's around the time of the Second Punic War. There is no Herodotus, Thucydides or Xenophon for Rome, 
which meant that the three sources I have cited need to be weighed and checked for their own biases and inaccuracies. This is what I meant when I said earlier that the difference in an account can be quite an eye-opener. Was it a genuine account of a situation which the others had missed, or was it more to do with moulding it to fit their world view? As an example, Dionysus talks about the fashionable disputes in the Senate between the Sabines and the Romans, or older families, whereas Livy omits it. Was this because presenting the Senate as a unified body versus the people was a better message for Roman readers, or was it the truth? I don't think we'll ever understand the rationale behind every decision the sources made on how they wrote about Numa, and I want to avoid navel-gazing too much. But what if we considered the history of Numa, and how they handled him, and whether it was influenced by existing or pre-existing events? And I say this because the adage, history repeats itself, was a sort of case towards the end of the 1st century BCE, a turbulent political clash involving civil wars had resulted in a single individual landed with the job of stabilising Rome, and some of you would have guessed I'm referring to Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. How Numa and Augustus took power in Rome are two very different stories. Numa's, as we have seen, involved a peaceful route. Augustus was one mired with the blood of fellow Romans. Yet they had both assumed power in Rome following a political crisis and were faced with immediate challenges. One strategy which Augustus sought to employ mimicked Numa's use of religion and going one step further, Augustus used Numa's image and reputation for his own gain. Like many a politician in antiquity, Augustus used coins to help sustain a message or image. Coins featuring Numa weren't a new thing though. In 97 BCE, L. Pompilius Molo minted a series of denarii, and as you might guess from his name, this was to give an indication of a descent from him. In 88 BCE, another descendant, C. Marcius Censorius, did the same thing. Even the famous Pompey got in the act in 49 BCE with yet another series of denarii featuring him. We can see from this that Numa was a good person to be linked to, which is important as it means we aren't just taking the accounts of the sources as citing this. The earliest coin which links Augustus, or Octavian as he would have been, to Numa was 40 BCE, and it featured a thunderbolt on the reverse side. Okay, it is a bit tenuous, but the thunderbolt, as I've mentioned, was linked to Jupiter and to Numa. This pattern was continued in 35 BCE when he minted denarii featuring himself with religious items, the Simpulum, indicating his role of pontiff, and the Litus as an augur. Both of these roles were founded by Numa. It's not until we get to the rule of Augustus where coins featuring him and Numa start to appear. In these, Numa sports an appropriately Sabine beard. As mentioned, it's a great association to have, particularly if you've just come out of a brutal civil war. Peace was essential to an exhausted Rome, and both Numa and Augustus came to have closed the doors of the Temple of Janus. Even in the Arapakis, the temple to Augustan peace, the connection is there, as Numa is depicted with his own altar of peace. It's quite meta. Augustus built his PR machine around themes consistent with Numa. There was the piety, and the name Augustus comes from August, which relates to temples and the concept of the sacred. Augustus repaired temples, and to quote Suetonius, increased priesthood in numbers and dignity too, being particularly generous to the College of the Vestal Virgins. You might also have seen statues in which Augustus has a hood, which was that of a priest. They're depicting him in that way. And in 12 BCE, he took the role of Pontifex Maximus. It's true that Augustus did many other things as well, but it cannot be ignored that he set himself in the mould which was very Numa-shaped. Anyway, I feel I've possibly soaked you with lots of speculation as to how Numa and Augustan culture interacted, so I'll stop. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Believe it or not, initially I was going to chat about the Roman kings in one single episode, and as you can hear, it all escalated. Depending on how much research I can do for my next episode, it might be on the remaining kings, or I might split them out individually. I've got plenty of topics as well to do, so don't worry, there'll be something out in five or six weeks' time. And as it's August, I know there'll be the obligatory Pompeii articles. And as such, check out my podcast from last year on Pompeii, and also, check out the article on my website. Don't worry, I'll be retweeting it. And to shoehorn that in, feel free to say hi on Twitter, where I am, at AncientBlogger. On AncientBlogger.com, you can find my Instagram and Facebook and YouTube channels. Have a look. If you're listening via iTunes, you know what I'm going to say. I don't have a budget for marketing, so reviews are crucial for me. Until next time, take care and keep safe.